Good evening and welcome to the Living Water live stream Bible study. Praise God. Living Water is an outreach of Soterios Ministries Incorporated. And we're going to jump into the word on tonight as soon as we uh, build the class. Praise God. I see some people are logging on. God bless you and thank you for joining me. Praise God. Share the link. Let people know we're here. Share the link to the um, notes. And if you are out there, um, say something in the stream so I know that you're there. I can greet you. Praise God. Hello, Kathy, over in Canada. God bless you. Good evening, Pastor Frederick. Uh, good evening, Margaret. Good evening, Pastor Steve. That's my family down in Mississippi. Those are good people down there. Uh, good evening, Gwendolyn. Um, good evening, my friend Ruth. Good evening, Adam. One of my favorite peeps. In the, I'm a little partial to Adam. You know, I, what can I say? <laughs> I like him. Um, good evening. Um, praise God. I'm glad you guys are logging on and wanting to um, jump into the word with me tonight. I think it should be pretty interesting. I've got some things I want to tell you. There's my friend, Farmer Ransom. Praise God. <laughs> That's my girlfriend, my you. Glad she's working and listening. Praise God. I got a new Bible I'm going to break in tonight. Of course I do. You know, I mean, really. No, actually, this, this Bible was a gift. This was given to me by uh, Shekinah Church um, um, during my commissioning to apostolic ministry. And... Um, they gave me this Bible. It's big <laughs> because it's a large print. Um, the older you get, the more um, it's it's not as large as the print in my other Bible that I just love. Um, but this one um, has wide margins. <sighs> That's like dying and going to Bible heaven. See? Can you see? See how wide the margins are? See all that space I have to write? Um, this is the New American Standard Version, but this is a Schuyler. See that symbol? Schuyler. What that means is it's very nice. <laughs> and it's expensive. Goatskin leather. Look at that leather. See how soft that is. The pages are phenomenal. These things are hand sewn and put together over in some foreign country. Let me see. I should know. Um, while we're waiting on people to join us, I'll tell you. Uh, this is the Heirloom Bible. Um, you can buy these on evangelicalbible.com. Evangelicalbible.com. Um, you need to be ready to kick out some cash if you're going to buy a Skyler Bible. But um, it's the type of Bible you'll never need another one, you know. They're, they're made that well. Praise God. This is the Quintel Wide Margin New American Standard. Going to break this in tonight. There's no print in it. Fresh pages. Praise God. All right. Uh, say hello if you just joined in. I see there are some people watching who have not said um, hello. I want to tell you real quick before we jump into the word, the Soterios Ministries app um, is available on all the different places where you can download apps. Praise God. Um, you can get it on Apple. You can get it through like the Google um 
you can get it through um, Amazon apps too, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Good evening, uh, Pastor Benita. Good evening, uh, Melanie. And um, if you go into those app stores and you put in um, Soterios uh, Cyber Church, Soterios Ministries Cyber Church, you should see the app. And when it comes, okay, you can't see it there, but when it comes up, It'll have our logo, which is an open Bible with a sword going through it. And um, download the app. It's free. But it's got lots of incredible things that will help you to um, stay connected. Um, when you go onto the app um, and you click on Cyber Church, it takes you to the different boxes. If you click YouTube, it'll take you to all of the uh, Bible studies going back like four years. There are Bible studies posted there for you. Um, upcoming events, if there's anything happening on the Soterios calendar, it'll be there. Um, there's a place where you can shop. You can buy, like a, I have a couple of um, DVD and CD series that you can purchase. But one button that I just added is the one that says Dr. Bernie's study notes. Can you see that? Uh, right there at the bottom, right there. Dr. Bernie's study notes. And each week I will put in the notes for the Bible study. So if you click that button, it will take you to a link that gives you tonight's Bible study notes right there in the app. Um, I think that's pretty cool. And another thing, the giving, the giving is through um, Subsplash. So if you're somebody who has, you support Soterios Ministries, you give through um, Cash App or you give through PayPal. Um, Subsplash, if you use the app, it has several other benefits. Uh, number one, Subsplash has bank level security. So your giving is more secure in terms of the transactions. It's more secure than um, PayPal and Cash App. I use both of those. This one I use too when I'm giving to my own ministry because it has bank level security. And it really helps me in that at the end of the year, um, Subsplash prints out each individual who gives a, an end of the year <coughs> tax receipt um, for your giving. And um, where's my, my water? For your giving and it sends it to you um, automatically. So you, you'll get your receipt that you can use when you file your taxes. So it's awesome. And it's got all kind of other things. You have to go in there and play with it. Um, you can take notes like during um, sermons and you can, um, uh, uh, send emails, you can call the ministry, all types of other things, um, but you have to play with it. You have to go download it and play with it. Set up an account in there and it'll really be a blessing uh, to you. Praise God. And you can have it like when you're driving in your car, hook it into your Apple Play or whatever you have in your car. You can listen to old Bible studies. Um, once I get my podcast going, there'll be a link to the podcast in there as well. You can listen to those, everything in one spot. So if you have not downloaded that app, if you, I think even if you have like Roku, like at home on your TV, you can even download the app onto your TV. How cool is that? You can watch all this stuff on a bigger screen. All right. Good evening. Um, let's see. Good evening, Donna. I'm going to be ignoring my cousin, Terry, this evening. This evening, hold on, hold on. Did Michigan lose? He says, what can I say? It was an excellent game. Um, MSU deserved to win. They played very well. Um, they played just like they had on the back of their helmets, relentlessly. They were relentless, praise God. And um, hoping that young man, um, Oh, what was his name? Walker the third. I can't think of his first name. Number nine, Walker the third. Phenomenal. He was a phenomenal um, player. So they get all the props. Go green, go white. 
Uh, they played excellent. Michigan, I thought, played pretty good too. And I did think some of those calls were very controversial that went MSU's way, but what can we say? We were in Lansing. Um, hello, Rosalind. Hello, neighbor. Praise God. Good evening, Sabrina. Good evening to my cousin, Mary, and my Aunt Mary. It's always good to see you guys on. Praise God. Good evening, Cheryl and Jane Wilkerson, um, Janice Patrick. Good evening. All right, guys. <clears throat> so, like I said, the notes are available in the app. On, in the box, click it that says Dr. Bernie's study notes and they're right there for you or they're on my Facebook page. You can download them into your tablets or that type of thing, depends on what you're watching me through. If you have a printer at home, print them out. Okay, let's pray so we can jump into this. I got some stuff I wanna tell you guys tonight. Oh, Kenneth Walter um, the third. I, I was, I was, okay, Kenneth Walter. Yeah, number nine. Thank you, um, Rosalind. Yeah, that was, um, he was a phenomenal player. What can I say? He was excellent. Um, Father, thank you um, tonight for the opportunity that you give us to come together um, in various states around this nation and even in other nations of the world. And um, we welcome our Canadian um, family um, and we'll be so glad when things open up and really open up and we can get back over there to fellowship with them. Um, for tonight, Lord, we thank you for bringing us together through um, this live stream Bible study. And Holy Spirit, we invite you to rest upon your word tonight. Take the key of revelation, unlock it, and take that seed of the word and sow it deep in our hearts that it might take root in our lives and ultimately break forth in us and through us, bringing an abundant harvest and glory to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I invite you to think through my thoughts and speak through my words and have your way on tonight. And we will bless you and give you the honor and the glory and the praise. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. So I'm going to be um, using the New American Standard uh, Bible on tonight. This is a new Bible that I'm breaking in. Like I said, it was a gift given to me. It's just been sitting there waiting on me to open it up and write in its pages. It has wide margins all the way around. It's like dying and going to Bible heaven. Praise <laughs> good. The paper is exquisite. The print is um, phenomenal. It's, it's, it's very well made for those of you who like good Bibles. This is a big one uh, because it's large. Um, it's um, got wide margins and it's a lot of Bible, uh, but it's, it's excellent. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I'm involved in um, some continuing education um, that I really, I really enjoy. Um, it's a two-year process. I'm um, looking to get a certificate in um, spiritual transformation. Um, I love the people that I'm connecting with, um, an ecumenical group um, of pastors and ministry leaders across denominational lines. So it's refreshing. It's good to be around, you know, um, get outside the camp that you, you know, hang out with and just kind of, um, you know, experience something fresh. And so for those of us who are getting the certificate, we have a stack of books that we are required. I mean, a list of books each between each quarter, you know, like, I mean, oh, you can't see, where's my, oh, you can't see it because the paper is white. I mean, a list of books that we're supposed to read in that three or four month period in between each retreat. And then we have a paper, like I have a paper that's due like in a week. Um, so I have a, like a book and a half that I'm finishing up. I've read everything else. So I'm reading this one book and 
it's on uh, the gift of contemplative prayer. You know, I, I love contemplative prayer. I'm very contemplative in nature, spiritually. Um, and so I'm reading the book and uh, there's some excellent points. You know, I'm like, yeah, that was good. Yeah, that was good. And then you kind of like, what? What? Wait, what did you just say? You know, you you know, you're reading, and you're thinking, what did he just say? So you make a look. Now I write in my books, and so I have little markers that I use. Sometimes I'll put big question marks in the margin if I'm like not really agreeing with what you're what you're saying. You know, but I'm gonna keep reading. You know, I'm trying to be with you. Then at a point, I started feeling manipulated. I'm like, okay, this author is very, he being sneaky about where he's trying to take me, to take the reader. But I was, you know, I was up on him. I was like, okay, because he kept slipping these little comments in that I said, well, I wonder, is he a universalist? Okay. And um, so I read and I got like, man, I might've had two, two chapters left. And he finally came out and said it, you know, what I was speculating all along, like he must be a universalist. He's, he's dropping some truth, but there was like just enough arsenic <laughs> mixed in there to make me very disappointed in the book, you know? I'm like, oh, what a waste, you know? And so he had strategically, you know, um, said little things that, um, uh, kind of set you up so that if you disagreed with him, you were going to fall into this category that he had already described and like, okay, you know, I'm smarter than the average bear. Okay. So I ain't buying that. So of course what it did, what it, that kind of thing, what it does is it drives me back to the word. What does the Bible say? You know, because there were these things that he kept saying that implied that he he he's a he's a Christian. Matter of fact, he's a Franciscan um, priest. He's a Franciscan priest, and he was saying things that was giving the indication that he believed that Christ and Christianity was the path for him but that all paths ultimately led to God and everybody was ultimately going to heaven. Universalism. Okay. For the record, I think that is heresy. <laughs> okay. Uh, somebody saying, show the book. Uh, I, I'll have to show it, you know, just message me later. I don't want to... Um, I um I don't want to just message me later and I'll, I'll I'll tell you what it is. It's on a list of required readings that I was required to read. I understand why the director of the program had us to read it. Um, she's an evangelical Christian. I understand why she had us to read it because he does drop some phenomenal truth, but he mixes the truth with what I identify as heresy. Uh, yeah, somebody must have saw it when I when I flashed it across the screen. Um, yes, uh, Gwendolyn, he is a favorite of Oprah's, which raised my antenna um, up uh, as soon as I saw that on the back of the book. You know, I really didn't pay any attention to that until I started reading it. And he started saying some things that made me kind of like, oh, but his concept of like liminal space and, you know, the, um, you know, silence and solitude is phenomenal. Oh, but then he just kind of took a left turn and went somewhere. And I was like, no. Okay. So tonight, okay, let me just, let me just show you the book. It's not the kind of book I don't think that the average believer is going to pick up unless they're friends of Oprah. Uh, but, wait, can you see this? It's called Everything Belongs, The Gift of Contemplative Prayer by Richard Rohr. 
I don't, I'm not going to recommend that you, you, you buy this. I mean, unless you are, um, unless you are mature enough to do like when I first got ready to go to seminary, one of the mothers, one of those old saints from the Pentecostal holiness church that I was a member of as a young person. When I got ready to go to seminary, I remember after the end of my first semester, I was home on break and I went to the church and I, man, I was ready to leave. I was ready not to go back. Um, and I remember one of the church mothers said to me, um, she said, it's just like eating um, fish, that kind of fish that's real bony, got a lot of bones in it. She said, you have to learn how to eat the meat and spit out the bones. That's what I would say about this book. <laughs> you have to eat the meat and spit out the bones. And in order for you to do that, you must know the word of God, okay? Other than that, I wouldn't recommend that you buy it. It is a um, bestseller. This guy is um, uh, um, the founder of the Center for Action and Contemplation. Does some other stuff. Written some other books. I was disappointed. Okay, so let's look at, let, so that's just to give you what drove me to these notes on today. So we have to ask the question, is Jesus God or is he a God? <laughs> okay, is Jesus God? Because if he is God, um... I don't think he would argue with that. He believes that he, he believes that. Well, he I'm getting ahead of myself. Let, let me start at the end and work my way back to the front. Okay. At the end of your notes, I put a term. It's on the last page. Um apokatastasis, which is a fancy Greek word that means apokatastasis, yeah, which means reconstitution or restitution. Let's start there. Okay. I'm going to start at the back and then we'll work to the front. So if you turn in your Bible to Acts chapter three and verse 27, and here's the thing that you have to, when you study in the word of God, you know, let the word of God interpret the word of God. Okay. Because God is not schizophrenic, you know, all, you know, um, it all, it, it'll, it'll, it'll interpret itself line upon line, precept upon precept, okay? In Acts chapter 3 and verse 21, this is where this whole concept of apokatastasis or which means reconstitution or restitution, here's where it comes from, Acts 3, 21. And it says in the New American Standard, um, well, go back up. Go back up to verse 19. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped out. Now, the people that are going to pull verse 21 out of context obviously didn't read verse 19. Verse 19 says, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away. So it implies that the wiping away or the washing away of your sins is contingent upon you repenting and turning back to God. Okay, that, that's in the book. That's what it says. And when you do that, it says in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you. This is the controversial verse, verse 21. Whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. So they take that verse where it speaks of the restoration. That's that Greek word, apokatastasis which means restitution or and they they understand it to mean everything meaning um 
everything, ev everything, you know, good, bad, ugly, Hitler, um, Lucifer, um, the angels that fell, that did all the crazy stuff you find in Genesis that brought about the Nephilim and all of that, all things, they take this verse to mean that there's going to come a day when everything will be restored to God through Christ, okay? Regardless of whether those persons or those things repented and turned to God. See, they forgot to read verse 19 and 20. They just jumped on verse 21 and said, um, this means that everything, including the damned in hell and the devil, will ultimately be saved. Okay, so um, this guy... If you're reading his book, <clears throat> if you're reading his book, he wants you to believe that um, that's what's going to happen, that everything will ultimately be um, restored or reconstituted in Christ, including all those things that I mentioned, Hitler, um, every evil, ungodly, atheist, um, you know, uh, cursed God, rejected Christ, um, ideology, person, system. The, the, he believes that it's all going to, we all going one day sit in fellowship with God through Christ, whether you respond to the gospel or not. You'll remember that guy who used to pastor over on the western half of the state, Rob Bell, he wrote a similar book that Oprah loved too, called Love Wins. They're saying the same thing. It's just in his book, he's talking about contemplative prayer. Um, and then he sneaks in that universalist thing, which I could have really done without. Um, and so is that biblical? That's my point. Is, is that biblical? Because in the book, he tells you that the church, and when he says church, he's referring to the Catholic church, because from his perspective, the Catholic church is the universal church, and that Protestants are just um, lost Catholics <laughs> who, who departed from the true faith, okay? That's another class. But um, he, he tells you in the book that uh, the universalism, let me stop saying that Greek word, universalism was never declared heresy. He claims that there were several church fathers that believed this, okay, and that the church never declared that anybody is in hell. So he does away with the concept of hell, and he wants you to believe that universalism is not heresy okay well he forgot that we have google <laughs> all you got to do is look it up all you have to do is google apocatastasis is it heresy and you will find that twice it was declared heresy and the, the 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 church fathers of the one or two that was espousing it were declared heretics and it was utterly condemned at the Council of Constantinople in 543 AD and in 553 AD. And of course, we didn't need those councils to say it was heresy. All you have to do is read the book. Okay. Somebody had a question. The second coming of Christ, isn't this the millennial kingdom? Uh, that is another class because it depends on your end time theological position. There are some people who believe that the second coming of Christ um, is when we are ushered into, you have that battle of Armageddon and the, the, the millennial reign of Christ. There are others who, um, um, and, and they say period, that he's just going to come and his second coming is it. There are others who believe that there's going to be a rapture. So they separate the rapture from the second coming of Christ. That's, a, that's another class that would take me forever to unpack. But um, that, that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about um, 
uh, or maybe like in the millennial kingdom. But in the, the Bible does not say that in the millennial reign of Christ, that all the people that are in hell, all of the, the, the fallen angels in Tartarus and, and Lucifer himself are ultimately going to be reconciled to God and sit around the throne, eating communion and breaking bread and drinking wine. You will not find that in this book. Okay, I'm just saying. And if you can find it, then you um, show it to me. Somebody says, my sister is a Catholic, likes Roar, his teachings scare me. Um, he is very clever, I'll say that. He, he do, his book, it's like, um, I mean, it's just, it's like something that tastes really good, uh, but it's got arsenic in it. So yeah, it, it is scary. It's for me as a leader, and as a teacher in the body of Christ, um, what alarms me is if people don't know the word, then they will swallow this hook, line, and sinker because this sounds good. This sounds good. This Everybody's going to make it. Doesn't matter how you live or what you do. That's not scripture. That's, that's not the word. Okay, so let's look at it. Okay. It's very dangerous. No, no, you're okay, Michelle. It's, um, it's very dangerous, okay? So now go back up to the top of the notes and you'll kind of see what fueled it. So let's start with the question, is Jesus God, okay? Because really we could start there and end there because if Jesus is God, then if you are worshiping Buddha or Allah or Krishna, or strange derivatives of Jehovah, or you think that you're evolving and that you're God, and all this other crazy stuff that you find in the world, which and we're moving rapidly towards one world religion, one world order, all the kind of stuff that you know there are people pushing for that right now. They're using the terminology right now, and so you have to answer the question: Is Jesus God? You can say, "Well, he he's God for me." No. That's not the question. I didn't ask, is he a God? I asked, is he God? Okay, so, and let me, before we open one passage other than the one in Acts, let me say that I will be deriving my answers to that question from this book, okay? I am unapologetically biased concerning the word of God. I believe the word of God is the word of the living God. I believe that there is no other book uh, given amongst men that carries the um, breath and the word and the revelation of God the way that the 66 books of the Bible does. Um, for me, this is the word of God. This is God speaking to me. I believe that I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I should live according to what it says that I, how I should live. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm, I, I am admittedly biased concerning the word of God. For me, this is truth. And so I will be answering the questions, is Jesus God using the word of God? Okay, um, this book has been burned, um, banned, um, and it still survives. You know, um, it is a living book. It is undeniably true in its precepts and its tenets, its concepts. It is a it is a written version of the living God. Okay, so let's start. Is Jesus God? Well, let's start in the beginning. Go to Genesis 1. And if you've got a pen or something that you can write with or highlight, there'll be things you might want to highlight and remember. And, and I will say that um, back in the day, well, I still do this now when I have like group person to person um, Bible studies. I used to give out these stickers, these little stickers. My Bibles, all of my Bibles have them sticking in the, in the margin. Let's see, can you see it? 
Oh, look over there. See these stickers? Yeah. They're, they're those little mail stickers. They're like two by four. And I type secrets and truths and revelation on them and give them to people to stick in the front of their Bible so that they can easily um, find things. And um, these um, uh, questions I had put on stickers that I used to use um, and in my classes. And so if you're watching me and you've got an old Bible that you've had for years and you've been in some of my old Bible studies, you will have some of these stickers in the front of your Bible. I used to use that, put those in my Bibles, like when I used to do the Ask the Pastor um, uh, program at TCT when I was on that panel, because questions would come in live. You want to be able to readily answer those questions for the people when you're live on the camera, you don't have time to be fumbling and the, and the thing is being broadcast around the world. And, um, uh, and then, you know, I wanted to be able to quickly access certain truths. And these three things that we're going to look at or we're going to try to get to today um, were always asked. People would always call in and ask on a regular basis, is Jesus God? Well, in, in Genesis 1 and verse 1, let's start there. Then we're going to drop down to verse 16. Then we're going to flip over to John. So if you have a nice Bible like this, where you got like all these ribbons, <laughs> you can put a ribbon in John chapter one, because we're going to go there in just a minute. And um, we're going to come back to that and go back to Genesis. Okay, Genesis one and verse one, we're answering the question, is Jesus God? Genesis one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In beginning, Bereshit, bara, Elohim. Um, and so that word for God, you could circle the word God, and you could write in the margin of your Bible the word Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M. In the Hebrew, whenever you see that I-M ending on a word, it is plural. And so this is the word for God, one God who is Elohim. And so the very first verse in the Hebrew scriptures implies um, God who is Elohim, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The triune nature of God is right there in the very first verse okay so it's 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 letting you know that there are there's one god elohim expressed in three personalities or three persons okay and it's in the very first verse of the bible it answers also the second question which is is God triune or is God a trinity? There are some people who say that the word trinity is not in the Bible. Um, okay, you could say that. But the concept is from Genesis to Revelation. Okay, and we're going to look at that in a minute. So in the beginning, God Elohim, that's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And of course, if you took my Hebrew language treasure hunting class which I don't have the time to reteach in this context, then you know that that word in, in beginning, Bereshit, is a picture of the father and the son. Um, and Bereshit bara, um, Elohim. So the bara is the word created, but the pictographic um, vision of that word, when you when you turn it on like a, Okay, thank you, Holy Spirit. When you, the, the, it's like the Word of God is like a hologram, okay? And there are times when you're reading it, it's like, whoa, the picture comes up off the page. Well, the Hebrew language is like that. So the word God created, that word created, bara, bar meaning sun, the aleph meaning um strong God, the son of God. So in the beginning, God, who? The creator, who's the creator? The son of God. So that's Jesus. 
Okay, you're going to have to trust me on that. You gonna, Of course, I do have those notes written down. If you could read it in the Hebrew, you would see it. In the beginning, God created. Who's the creator? The sun was actively involved in the creation of all things. Okay, and so then look down at verse 16. Um, uh, or that might be, let's see. Verse 18, let's see, and God made the two great lights. Um, no, that's that's a, that's probably a typo. I think I want that to be, that should be 26. Change that 16 to, to verse 26. Let me change it in my notes. Uh, Genesis 1, where it says 16, make that 26. In Genesis 1, verse 26, it says, then God, Elohim, said, let us, let us, and that us is again a picture of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Elohim, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and so you see, G you, you, as a, as a New Testament believer, you say, well, who is this us? Is, is that, is Jesus included in that? Okay, let's flip over to um, John, because we're going to take it line upon line, precept upon precept. John 1 and verse 1, and then we're going to drop down to verse 14. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God, okay? So, well, who is the word? The logos. In the beginning was the word, the revelation, the revelation um, of God. Everything that God is, the word, you know, the picture, the word was, and that, that was God and was with God. Well, who is that? Verse 14 in John, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so John is talking about Jesus, okay? So John tells us that Jesus is the word who was in the beginning, the word that as God speaks, and the word brings what God speaks into manifestation with the help of the Holy Spirit. You see the Trinity involved in the creation of all things, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, okay? And so, you know, um, I believe that Jesus is God, and you may believe that Jesus is God, but what if your son or your neighbor or your, or your, your co-worker and you all are talking and they say, well, show it to me in the word. You need to be able to do more than say, well, I say that Jesus is God. Show it to them. Take the time to open the book and show it to them. That's why I'm giving you the scriptures. So that you can say, okay, well, let's look at it. I don't have to defend God. <laughs> God is big enough to defend God's self and his word is big enough to defend him. Okay, what does the word of God say? So let's flip over to John chapter five and verse 18. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, talking about Jesus, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Okay, let's keep going. John 8 and verse 58. Flip over to John chapter 8. And verse 58, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Now that, you should highlight that if you're reading your Bible, highlight and circle the word I am. That was so profound. Jesus said to them, before Abraham was born, I am. 
So essentially, he speaks to them the yod Hey vav Hey, the name of God that Jews believe is too holy to even utter it. Well, he not only said it, but he, he applied it to himself, okay? He said that he was the I am, the yod Hey vav Hey, which, you know, you'll see in your Bible is translated in the Old Testament as Lord in all caps. Um, some people write it out as Yahweh, you know, that type of thing, um, because they can't get back to the original pronunciation because Jews don't say it out loud. But it's the, it's the letters Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. And you know, from my Hebrew language treasure hunt class, the pictographic meaning of the word, the Yod is... Um, uh, um, behold the hands, behold the nails. Um, the strong arm of God, the yod is like a, it's like a bicep, you know, the strong arm and the hand of God. And then you have the, the letter he, which means behold, it's like two hands lifted up, behold. And then you have the vav, which is a nail. And then you have another he, yod, he, vav, he. So the picture says, behold the hands, behold the nails. So the, their very word for, for God, for Lord, is a revelation of Jesus Christ. So when he says, before Abraham was born, I am, not only is he referring to himself as being God, but he also is prophesying the crucifixion saying I am he that will be crucified on the cross I am the lamb I am the lion of the tribe of Judah I am um the I am you know so it's right there so flip over to John chapter 10 and verse 30 and there's more references these are just a few that you can use John 10 and verse 30 um, look at this one. He says it very plainly. I and the Father are one. There you go. I'm going to highlight that in my Bible. <clears throat> I and the Father are one. Um, look at verse 33. Uh, look at verse 33. Uh, why this person is calling me on a Tuesday. Um, and it's the Jews answered him, for a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself out to be God. And so the Jewish people of his time realized that he was referring to himself as God. Okay, he, he called himself God. Okay, look at John chapter 20 and verse 28. John chapter 20 and verse 28. Thomas, this is after the um, resurrection when Thomas sees him alive. And Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. We could stop right there, but let's look at a few more. <laughs> just for Bible fun, okay? Flip over to Philippians. And of course, if you don't have the sticker, just write these in the front cover of your Bible or write it. If you have one of those Bibles, um, is this one of them like this one? Uh, does this one? Yeah. See, this Bible has these note pages in the back. Uh, you can't see it because of the camera lights. It's um, lined paper where you can take notes and you can write this stuff in the back of your Bible so that if, you, if you're ever sitting and talking to somebody and you have to explain these things to them, you can explain these, these things to them. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Look at this. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God. And I did a, a teaching where I broke that apart. That word for form means in very nature. And he was in very nature God. Okay. So when, when that says 
that he existed in the form of God is essentially saying in the Greek that he was in very nature God, okay? But he did not regard equality with God to be a thing to be grasped. In other words, he didn't hold on to the benefits and the perks of being God. That's the purpose of this passage. He emptied himself he, he made himself of no reputation and he pour, he emptied himself of the perks and the benefits and the privilege of being God Almighty. And instead, he took on the form or the nature of a bondservant, a doulos, being made in the likeness of man. That's why theologians say that Jesus was fully God and fully man. But while he walked in the earth, he did not operate in the power. Um, he didn't operate as God. He operated as a man who had to live in relationship with God so that he could model the way that you and I are supposed to live. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, let's look at Colossians 2 and 9. Colossians 2 and 9. And um, let's see. What is Exodus Three fourteen. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say the son of I am has sent me to you. Yeah, that's the uh, Exodus 3.14 is the, the reference, um, one of the references to um, the God giving Moses his name where he calls himself the I am. Okay, that's a very important name um, to Jews. And so when Jesus uh, appropriated that name as his own, that was big. Okay, flip over to uh, Colossians 2 and verse 9. For in him, uh, this is talking about Jesus, in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Come on. That I, I don't know how people get this stuff mi mixed up. I, you know, I, I can see how how everyday ordinary folks sitting in the pew who are maybe our new believers and they don't know God, they don't really know the word, or maybe they're baby Christians, they're just coming to know God and they they they've not read all of this stuff. But people who have like all of these letters after their names. <laughs> And they are ordained and consecrated members of the covenant of elders and, and the fellowship of clergy. They need a good butt whipping, in, in, in my opinion. Because right there, Colossians 2 verse 9, For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Right there. Let's flip over to Titus. Titus. Chapter uh, 2 and verse 13. Look at this. Looking for the, uh, let's see, let's, let's, um, let's start in verse 11. Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. That's where I got the name of Soterios Ministries from, Titus 2.11. That's our foundational um, text for Soterios Ministries because in the Greek, that word for salvation is the word Soterios. The grace of God has appeared that brings Soterios, salvation, healing, deliverance, restoration to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness that means that you, you, you can't just live any kind of way. Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Here we go. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Okay. How did that get in the Bible? Come on, there it is, right there. In black and white, flip over to Hebrews chapter one and verse eight. Now, you know, the scripture says 
in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let, you know, everything be established. And of course, this is a lot more than two or three witnesses, but just to seal it in your mind so there's no confusion. And so maybe you'll remember one or two of these references if you ever have to talk to anybody. Like you have, um, let's see, my friend Kathy over in Canada saying she's heard people say that God is a sheep. That's another class <laughs> too. Um, the, you know, maybe I, I, I'll, I'll do something like that at a point, the sexuality of God. Um, that one goes kind of deep because we believe that <clears throat> God transcends sexuality in the way that we know sexuality as physical humans. <clears throat> um, that God is, the scripture says God is spirit and um, that spirit is a consuming fire. Um, but Jesus referred to God as his father. Now I will say um, without knowing what whoever that was said to you, um, I will say there are very feminine images of God that are in scripture. They're often overlooked um, and not preached on. Um, and that has to do with misogyny and just the um, way that the church for a long time um, kind of relegated women to a certain perspective. So you, you have people in defense of women going to the, the opposite extreme and, and losing the balance. There are feminine images of God. El Shaddai. Um, you know, is a very feminine image, okay? El Shaddai, which is translated as Almighty God. But when you study the etymology of the word, you find that it's a reference to like the, it's an image of uh, a mother um, whose breasts fill with milk to, to nourish her, her, her crying child. That's a very feminine image of God that is often not taught. OK, and so you'll have people that take that to an extreme and they say that God is a she. God transcends. Um, uh, God transcends um, those fragile attempts at defining um, uh, just the vast, you know, how vast and how big God is. But I personally refer to God as Father because that is what Jesus said. And Jesus would know. <laughs> okay, that just they are. That's not hard in my mind, you know, calling him Mother Nature. Okay, that's kind of that's kind of crazy too. You know, I don't know why we play with stuff like that. Let's just let's just call it what the word says, okay? Jesus said. He, you pray to my father, the father. And so let's just leave it at that, okay? Um, where were we? Hebrews <clears throat> 1 and verse 8. But of the son, he says, you're speaking of God, the father. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. <clears throat> so look at this. Of the son... He says, your throne, O God. So here in Hebrews, there's a reference to the Son as God. Flip over to 2 Peter 1 and verse 1. You know, I think if we would just stay with the basics, we would not go astray. You know, I mean, I, I, I love theological discourse and I like, you know, going deep in the word, but not so deep, not so deep that you're going to lose your sense, <laughs> your good sense, okay? Um, 2 Peter 1 and verse 1. Um, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, our God and Savior, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so here Peter um, refers to um, Jesus as God and Savior. Okay, so now 
look at Genesis 18. Uh, what's in Genesis 18? Oh, man, where does the time go? Uh, Genesis 18 and verse 1. Uh, this is... Oh, um, this is where uh, the Lord, the yod he vav he Now, again, um, in, if, you, if you're looking at your Bible, that word for Lord is in all caps. So that's the Godhead, um, the yod he vav he Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. So there are, um, um, it is believed that this is the pre-incarnate Christ appearing to Abraham. Um, so in other words, by pre-incarnate, the incarnation or the, the conception of Christ in the womb of Mary, this as a child, this is prior to that, Jesus as God, the, you know, um, in the beginning God, okay? Um that appears to um, uh, Abraham, to Abram at this point. I don't know if he had changed his name yet at this point, um, but he appears to him. And so this is a picture of Christ prior to. So now the Lord, and he's referred to as the Lord. The Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, Three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, my Lord, again, okay. Now, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by. Um, <laughs> well, that'll, that'll sing, won't it? You know, um, you know, pass me not, O gentle savior, hear my humble cry while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Okay, right there. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, so do as you have said. So Abraham, okay, yeah, his name has changed at this point. Hurried into the tent to, um, to Sarah, okay, you know, cool. Okay, they're here, okay. And so um, they begin to give him the revelation of um, the birth of Isaac. <clears throat> and so the point of the passage is that, like when you get to verse 22, look at Genesis 18 and verse 22. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom while Abraham was standing before the Lord. So this is the pre-incarnate Christ. He's standing before. This is the Lord God, okay? Um, and he begins to share with him what he's about to do concerning Sodom and Gomorrah. So now let's compare that to John 1 and verse 18, which we just looked at. So we know that this is not the father. This is the pre-incarnate Christ. You can say, well, how can you say that was Jesus? Because John 1 and verse 18 says, no one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the father. He has explained him or he has, he has exegeted him. He's the exegesis of him. So in other words, no one has seen, you know, at this time, God the father, all the God sightings, in the Old Testament are of the pre-incarnate Christ. Knock, knock, knock. Are you out there? Are you guys out there? Okay, I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. The only begotten God, the only begotten God, look at that circle, the only begotten God, that's Jesus, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made him manifest. When you look at that, or he has explained him, he is the explanation. He's the exegesis. He is the, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Okay, remember that? That's in the New Testament. That's who Jesus is. And, and there is verse after verse after verse. Let's look at one more. Oh, let's look at, let's look at one more. Let's look at Isaiah 
48. Go back to the Old Testament. I know you're doing a lot of flipping around in your Bible tonight, but that's good. You need to touch it and feel it and turn the pages. Let it breathe. Um, Isaiah 48, verses 12 and 13. Isaiah 48, verses 12 and 13. Now, what does this say? Listen to me, O Jacob, even Israel, whom I called. I am he. Look at this. I am the Aleph and I am the Tav. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. That's probably what it says in Hebrew. I am the first and also the last. I am the first and also the last. Now, you should put a little mark by that. I'm the first and the last. Surely my hand founded the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand together. <laughs> That's so phenomenal. He says, I am the first and the last. I'm the beginning. And then, okay, so now let's compare Isaiah. Listen to me, O Jacob. Even Israel, whom I call, this is God speaking, right? Okay, I'm the first and the last. So then, of course, if you know the Bible, you know in Revelation that Jesus is revealed in Revelation 1. Let's look at this. And verse 8, this is Jesus um, who is giving this message to his servant, John. He's get, this is an unveiling of him like he has never been seen before. And so look at verse 8. This is Jesus, God. Speak. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. It's the same thing. I am the first and the last. I'm the Aleph and the Tav in the Hebrew. I'm the Alpha and the Omega in the Greek. It means the same thing. It says, the Lord God. Who said it? The Lord God. Who is, who was and who is to come, the Almighty, that's me. That's essentially what he's saying. This is Jesus speaking. He refers to himself as the Lord God, the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end, and everything in between, which lines up with Isaiah 48 and verse 12 and 13. I am he, I am the first, and I am the last, okay? So... Man, I'm telling you. Um, let's see. Uh, all right, let's see. Deuteronomy 10 and verse 7. Let's do one more. Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 10 and verse 17. And then put a finger in Revelation chapter 17. <clears throat> We're going to compare these because the Bible can interpret itself. Deuteronomy 10 and verse 17. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. You don't have to go back and highlight these. Um, hello, Pastor Moses um, from Uganda. Praise God. Thank you for, for watching on tonight. Or it might not be night where you are. I'm not sure what time it is. Um, okay, Deuteronomy 10. Look at that. Verse 17. Now let's compare that to Revelation 17 and verse 14, Revelation 17 and verse 14, these will wage war against the lamb and the lamb will overcome them. The lamb, who is the lamb? Jesus is the lamb of God and the lamb will overcome them. Why? Because he is Lord of lords and king of kings. Look back at, uh, what was that? Deuteronomy 10 17, for the Lord your God is the God of God and the Lord of Lords. Revelation, Revelation 17, 14. What does it say again? 
the lamb, he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Okay. So again, that is another passage of scripture that proves that Jesus is God. Okay. He is not a God. He is God. And see where some uh, false religions miss it, like, um, for instance, like the Jehovah's Witnesses with what they do with John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jehovah's Witnesses say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. If you change that verse to a God, then you just relegated him to the same status as all these other um, gods that pop up all around the world, these wannabe gods. But that's not what J um, John 1 and 1 says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, period. Not a God, was God, is God. Not a God, is God. Okay, can you, you do you hear the difference in, in that sentence? You know, the, the, the Bible that Jehovah's Witnesses used to use, um, they've changed it now. They'll come knocking on your door using the Bible that, that um, you carry, but they'll still interpret it the way that they interpret it, okay? All right, let's, um, oh man, there's so many more. Um, all of these passages of scripture that I listed for you are proof positive that Jesus is God. Um, Isaiah 48, 16. Um, there's countless verses in scripture. Isaiah 48, 16. Come near to me, listen to this. For from the first have I not spoken, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it took place, I was there. And now the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. Uh, that's a picture of the Trinity. Um, um, like the triune uh, God, the Lord God has sent me and his spirit. That's like the, 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 the Lord and the Holy Spirit. Um, getting to the next, my next point, which I'm going to get to in a minute, is God. <clears throat> triune. Um, um, let's see, when you're dealing with um, people who are um, caught up in cult-like religious groups, one of the passages that you can use is 2 Timothy 3 and verse 7. Um, well, you have to understand that they're always learning never able to come to a knowledge of the truth, um, unfortunately, you know, because the truth is right there. And you can show them, listen, you're learning, but you're not coming to a knowledge of the truth. Jesus is the truth. And the scripture repeatedly, and all these verses that I just showed you, we skipped over a few of them, but they all refer to, or they make reference to the fact that Jesus is the Lord God Almighty. Um, if Jesus was God, is God, um, you know, people would say, well, how can man kill God? You know, well, how did Jesus die? He died on the cross. He, scripture says he laid down his own life. He laid his life down. He gave himself. He presented himself as a sacrifice. Who raised him from the dead? Well, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Let's look at John. Chapter 10 and verses 15 through 18. And it says this, even as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep, I lay down. So he laid his life down. He laid his life down for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. I lay down my life 
so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. The commandment I received from this commandment I received from my father. So, you know, um, um, you know, people will ask, well, if Jesus was God, how could man kill God? Well, he laid his life down, you know, he presented himself, you know, he emptied himself and allowed these things to be done to him, the scourging and the, the crucifixion, you know, um, as the lamb of God, he laid his life down and then he took his life back up again and can't nobody do that but God. Okay. Um, John 19 and verse 30. Let's look at that real quick. John 19 and verse 30. Um, oh, this is uh, on the cross. This is showing um, when Jesus gave up his spirit that he bowed his head when, when, when it was finished, when the debt had been paid, when the legal transaction that was the cross was complete and the sin debt had been atoned for, then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Okay. So God very much in control. All right. So then let's move to the next question. Um, people will say that um, one of the problems that people sometimes have with Christianity is that they say <clears throat> um, the concept of the Trinity, that we believe in three gods. No. One times one times one is still one. That's what they taught me in math. One times one is one. One divided by one divided by one is one. Okay. Um, so, and then we, we use this picture. Um, why do we say God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Because that's who they are. That's the... the, the um, that's God. That is the mystery of the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God expressed in three distinct personalities. One God, Echad. We read earlier in Genesis, I mean, um, in John, where it says that Jesus came out of the bosom of the Father. One God, Jesus came out of the bosom of the Father. Um, that's a phenomenal picture to me. So I see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one and yet distinct. One and yet distinct. There's no competition um, or schism in the Godhead. If you, you know, oh, that's another, that's another class because some people feel like you have to pray to the Father in the name of the Son. You know, that if you pray and say Jesus, oh, you now, oh, you're praying wrong. You got to pray to the Father. That's, that's a little schizophrenic for me. When I say Lord, um, that word is all inclusive. Lord means Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so look at the three leaf clover. Here's, here's a way of answering that question. Um, Melissa, look at that, that, that it's not a four leaf clover. I'm sorry. It's a three leaf clover. Look at that. Um, it's, is this one leaf or is it three? This three leaf is, 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 it's called a, a, a clover. Is it one leaf or is it three? It's only got like one stem and yet there seem to be three parts to it, but it, those three parts make one leaf, one little leaf. See, you know, it's, um, you know, and you'll have people use the example of an egg, you know, you, you have the egg, you crack the egg. Now you have the shell, you separate the yolk from the egg white. You have the shell, 
the, the yolk and the egg white, one egg, three distinct parts, one egg. We are triune in nature. We are a person, a human, who is um, a spirit that has a soul that lives inside this body. We are spirit, soul, and body, okay? And so we are triune in nature, just like our God is triune in nature. Yeah, it's um, the shamrock, it's a, it's a clover. The, the shamrock, it was defined as a clover, shamrock online, it was the same thing. Same thing, whatever, that little picture, yeah. Okay, the picture in your notes, yeah. Um, and, unless you're not looking at the notes so you didn't see the picture. Yeah, it's a picture of a shamrock slash three-leaf clover in your notes, which is a picture of because those three, what we call three leaves, actually is just one leaf, okay? Um, Genesis 1.16 we already looked at that. I'm, I'm sorry, that should be 126. That is another typo. Change that 116 to 126. Um, where let us make man in our image. That is a picture of the Trinity. And if we look at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, now look at this. After this is at the baptism of Jesus. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. The heavens were open. They were torn open. And John the Baptist sees the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. So you have Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit, and then you have the voice of the Father that says, "Be this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So right there, if you, you highlight those verses in your Bible, that is a picture of the triune Godhead. You see all three persons of the Trinity right there, okay? Um, let's look at 28, Matthew 28. Oh man, time goes too fast. 28 and verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. So again, you have a picture of the triune Godhead right there in that passage. Um, let's look at real quick. We got to go faster uh, because we'll have to pick up hell next week because that's a whoo. That's a that's a controversial one. <laughs> let's look real quick at Second Corinthians um, thirteen because listen, if you are a universalist, you have to do away with hell. There, there can't be eternal punishment if everybody is, if everything and everybody belongs. No, it's too bad. I was, I was disappointed because it's some good points in there, but then he mixed it. He poured a little arsenic in it and that just <sighs> grieved my soul. Um, let's see, where were we? In 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14 uh, for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of Holy Spirit be with you all. That again is the triune Godhead. Jesus, God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Um, and those other passages of scripture, you'll find the same thing. Um, oh, um, let's look at Jude real quick. Jude. It's only one chapter. It's that book right before the revelation. It's almost strategically placed like a warning before the unveiling of Christ and his um, uh, uh, power and glory. Um, Jude 20 and 21 says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, 
Keep yourselves in the love of God and waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. How far did I want us to go? And have mercy on self. Okay. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in my praying in the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Um, keeping yourselves in the love of God. That's the saying is the picture of the Father. And um, the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, it's a picture of the Godhead, the triune nature of the Godhead. In, in John 1, in verse 1, you find the Son of God mentioned as God. In 2 Thessalonians um, 1 and verse 2, you will find the Father is mentioned as God. In Acts chapter 5, that's a powerful passage where you had the husband and wife who decided they were going to hold back, you know, some, some money and deceive the early church, which really wasn't necessary. They could have just sold their land and said, we're giving this much to you and we're going to hold on to this much. But they didn't do that. They did it deceptively and they lied about it. And so um, Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, and so when they come to Peter, Peter says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land while it remained unsold? Did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why have you conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Look back at verse number um, three. Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. In verse four, you have not lied to men, but to God. You lied to the Holy Spirit. You have lied to God. And so again, um, you will find the Holy Spirit is mentioned as God. The Son is mentioned as God. The Father is mentioned as God. One God expressed in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God Almighty, Jesus is the exegesis, the manifestation, the explanation in the flesh of God, you know, who walked amongst us and with us. And then he sends his Holy Spirit at Pentecost, who lives and abides within us. And so we're out of time, but next week we will pick it up. And then I'm going to look at, is eternal punishment real? Is hell a real place or is it um you know something that theologians came up with to keep people under control which is what some some people will say you know so again i understand why we were assigned this book to read i was just disappointed in the conclusion and i was very aware as i was reading that the writer was manipulating the reader, trying to gently coerce you into a certain um, uh, understanding. And um, so I would not recommend that the average person in the pew uh, buy this book and read it. Um, you'd have to read it like you're eating really bony fish. You have to eat the meat, and spit the bones out because it's a lot of bones in that book. Um, so what is Tom saying? We have Jewish friends. What are some best Old Testament scriptures that you would recommend for us to use? Uh, regarding what? You got to clarify that. Um, what regarding Jesus being God or you got to tell me uh, what you're, you, you want Old Testament scriptures for. Okay, people, we are out of time. I will, you have been watching the Living Water live stream Bible study, Bernadine Wormley Daniels, Soterios Ministries Incorporated. Download my new app, Soterios Cyber Church, and you can use the give button. It'll take you through Subsplash. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a safe way to give and to support the ministry, or you can still give using paypal.me forward slash Soterios Ministries, or you can um, use um, uh, Cash App at dollar sign Dr. Bernie SMI, okay? 
Thank you. God bless you. And I will see you on next week. Praise God.